The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. My t- uh, topic is when God seems distant, when God seems distant. In, in Psalms chapter 13, we see an individual, and that was David. And I could s- truly agree that this man I have learned a lot from. I've learned a- from him because I actually would picture in my n- mind of David and the struggles that he went through in his early years and and I could and as I went through these struggles I would always go back and and through the Old Testament because I love the Old Testament more than I ever had before because I could see God at work and of course I love the Old and uh, New Testament but I love David I love David because I said wow David you've been there you you're you're sharing your thoughts with me and of course God uh, uh, helped him and and orchestrated in his life but it says here in verse 13 how long O Lord will thou forget me forever how long will thy hide thy face from me how long shall I take counsel in my soul having sorrow in my heart all the day How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have overcome him. Lest my adversaries rejoice when I am shaken. But I have what? Trust in thy loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. When God seems distant, I was reading an article about these two pastors. And this particular pastor went to hear a well-known Bible teacher. And after after hearing him preach, I want you to listen to what he has to say. At the time, I had been going through a dry spell. Maybe some of you, uh, maybe some of you had been there through these dry spell when God seemed so distant. So he was going through a dry spell, and he said, in my spiritual life. So I asked him, This Bible teacher, I asked him what he did during his personal devotions and if he ever had dry times in his spiritual life. I was rather surprised when he answered that he never had a dry time with the Lord. I pursued the manner, challenging his answer, but he stuck to his guns, insisting that he never had times when God seemed distant. He gently rebuked me, by saying, brother, if you expect nothing from God, you will get it all, you get it every time. In other words, the source of my spiritual dry spell was my lack of expectancy and faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we do sometimes go through dry spells, but unless you're a super duper spiritual mature Christian, Maybe this won't fit you, but I've been there. I've been so dry sometimes, and even though I pray and and I ask God, I said, where are you during these difficult times? I had many of these hard times, even in Christian ministry. I spent 16 years at a Bible camp, and one of my my, uh, things that I did that he enjoyed the most was to take care of all the guest groups that would come to our uh, to the camp, 
And of course, on the weekends, they would come, and I miss church quite often on because I'd rather be at church, but these guest groups come to find, uh, uh, spend time with the Lord because it was in a beautiful setting. But through those dry times at camp, I always ask my wife, I, says, Lord, I said, Elise, I'd like to go to Nova Scotia. I'd like to go there. But you know something? For 16 years, the Lord was prepar- preparing me because, because I didn't know the things what I've learned at camp was to, was to, uh, was to uh, prepare me here in Nova Scotia. I can remember sitting around the board table, uh, board meeting uh, at church. I was on a deacon board, and uh, and I was complaining in front of some of the deacons. And one brother kind of leaned over to me and says, "The more you complain, the more you complain, God's going to keep you in Egypt." And I thought about. I says, he says, I know you're le- you want to go to that promised land, but God is preparing your heart now, not when you get to Nova Scotia. And so I says, well, what he, what he said made sense. This pastor spoke to my heart about these spiritual dry times. The question I'm going to ask you is this, have you been in that valley of dryness spiritually? And you pray and pray, crying out to the Lord about a situation you are going through. You need to answer now. Oh, Lord, where are you? Answer me now. We could see that with David. He needs answers. And, uh, and we're going to see through this in Psalm 13, David, the man whom God called a man after my own heart, had that experience. He describes it in Psalm chapter 13. Out of the depths of his heart, David repeated four times, four times the haunting cry, How long, O Lord, how long? Have you been there through your situation? You're asking God, how long must I go through this? How long must I go through these dry times? How long are you distant from me? Where are you, God? I know, you know, that these things are really hurting me inside. And verse 1 of verse 13 says, How long, O Lord, will thou forget me forever? How long would thou hide thy face from me? David needed God so much. Because you have to go back through, uh, through the times when things were difficult for David. When Saul, who was anointed, and, and he was king over Israel. But that somewhere along the line, they, uh, Saul left God, the spirit was taken, and now he had a spirit that was really... Because when he heard David becoming king... Guess what? Jealousy entered Saul's heart. And now, here, David uh, did some miraculous things and seen things. But then it says in verse 2, How long shall I take counsel in my soul? He said, in other words, he's saying, How long am I to reason within myself to figure out a situ- how to get out of my situation? And then he says, having sorrow in my heart all the days, how long would my enemies, enemy exalted over me? There is no indication in these verses that David had sinned, but his enemy is about to get him. Can you imagine someone or something in your life, something's going to get you? And you're asking God, how long, Lord? How long? In spite of David's repeated prayers, God seemed unavailable. Have you been there? When you're laying in bed and you're, you're tossing and turning, you're crying, and all you can see is the white ceiling in your bedroom. Have you ever been there? You desperately call out to God, but he seems to have taken an extended vacation. I've been there. I know what it's like. 
And, and, and the first thing I do, I, I, I cry out to God, but then I started asking people. Instead of waiting on God, I go to people to try to figure out what's going on in my life. Psalm 13 tells you what to do when God seems distant. The Psalms falls into three stanzas of two verses each. We see the first one, the problem, is in chapters 13, 1, and 2. The petition we see is 13, 3, and 4, and the praise verses uh, chapter 13, 5, and 6. The stanzas seems to decrease in their magnitude or turmoil that David is going through. At first, David cries out in anguish. Then he offers a more gentle petition. Finally, he rests in the joy of knowing that God will answer him. You see, David had such an experience. Have you, uh, when I used to walk around the camp at night <clears throat> when I was on guard duty, because there were so many children during the uh, uh, camp season, <clears throat> excuse me, that I would go out and pray out in this field. And I would look up into the stars and I thought about David as he was tending sheep. He would look up at the stars and, and all you could see is trillions and trillions of stars and you're thinking about and worshiping God and, and here you're all by yourself. And, and I could see David with all those sheep lying around and, and chewing and, you know, just grazing. And David was just singing and praising God and and all these things. So he did know God. He had that experience of knowing God. <clears throat> what the psalm is saying in chapter 13, when God seems distant, we must call to him and trust in his what? Unfailing love. We must, must trust <clears throat> in, in his unfailing love. And that is when you have your relationship with God. You know God. You are uh, growing in the Lord. You are maturing day by day. Even though you don't see it, God sees it. But it takes time in growing in the Lord. At those times when it seems as if God has turned his back, we must trust the fact that he loves us with an unfailing love and that he will not forsake us, even though it may seem that way for a while. I would say things like this. Lord, you don't love me. You don't care for me what I'm going through. And, and all these things, my wife would just sit in the background and not say a word. Because she was praying. It, I even got to a point, was I really saved? Do I know you, Lord? I thought that that moment when back at this, you know, time in my life that you brought me around, you put my feet on solid ground, you took my eyes away from, from what I used to do years ago. But I was going through those things. I was forgetting, and, and you'll see through the message that we have an enemy and he will come around and put his arms around you and whisper in your ears, not screaming or hollering. He say, that's right. God doesn't love you. Look, you know, look what you're going through. Where is he? he, he did he bandage you? And so you start listening to other voices in your head. But, folks, I can't, you know, this is me. I went through this. But you will... Maybe one day as you pray and ask God to help you, that, Lord, yes, you do love me. I'm not going to allow the enemy to whisper in my ears and say, you don't love me. So let's examine these three parts of the Psalm 13. The first one, the problem, God seems distant. <clears throat> God's distance in the face of enemies Enemy results in a lot of turmoil in David's life. He, there's things in his life that he had, you know, he's being chased by Saul. And Saul wanted to kill him. 
and yet he was the anointed one to take that throne. It seems as if God had for, forgotten David, had hid himself from him, and as if it were last, it would last forever. I thought the same thing. I said, Lord, this situation I'm going through, it seems like it's going on forever. When is it going to stop? And my wife says, the more you complain against God, the more he's going to take you more through it. And so I says, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. I, I, I'm trying to get my head around these situations. But and it's, it lasts forever. It seems that at times of intense trials last forever, doesn't it? Have you been through trials? Have you been where you don't think you're going to make it? Have you? Trials, that's a terrible thing. But I thought of many, many brothers and sisters. And I read about the heavenly man. And I read about his trials when he was being persecuted by the Chinese government and what he went through in prison. It wasn't, it wasn't not a picnic in what he went through and he would cry out to God. And, but yet in his heart he knew that God loved him even though he was being beat up day after day. They would take him. His legs were crushed. He was crushed. And, he, and you know, he never did. Dad, it says, God, I know you love me. I know you're going to take me through it. And at times he wanted to complain, but he didn't. There was people chasing him. He gets out of, out of prison, and then, then he go out and still preaches the gospel message. He, wouldn't, he went into caves where Christians would gather together and hear God's word, not for 40 minutes, not for 45, not for an hour, but three hours, four hours, digging into God's word. Folks, we become too easy in North America, sitting here for 45 an hour. Sometimes I, I would sit down and listen to uh, the Pastor Kamal. I said, Pastor Kamal, come on. I know you have a lot more to say. I know you, your heart is filled with joy and, and you want to express your love. And, you know, can you imagine sitting here, folks, for three, four hours? You, you know, my tummy's getting, but there's folks that are so thirsty, hunger for the, what, word of God. But, it, but, they, but these people, the ones that have gone through all this more than we ever have, they lean on the unfailing of God's love. The hard thing about waiting is that you have to wait. Right? Martin and I were talking about waiting. I thought we were going to talk about my message. But don't you hate to wait? Waiting is especially hard if you don't have much to do while you wait. I had to wait. Sometimes God See, God is on, God doesn't, you know, we're on timetable. God isn't. The hours, days, weeks, months drag on as David waited for God, what, to act. It sometimes it seems as if God moves so slowly. But we live in a days of today that says, hurry, hurry, hurry. I finally, folks, I have put my... Uh, uh, resignation at Tim Hortons. I worked there for four hours or four years at Tim Hortons and I said to them, I'm finished. And of course, when I put my thing in, they said, Ben, do you have to leave? Do you have to leave, Ben? And then the customers, because I, I, I said uh, to my manager, I, I'm, boy, I'm busy wa working, working, working. She says, you're busy talking, talking, talking. That's me. I, and uh, I talk to all the customers. I, you know, make them feel at home. Everyone that comes to the door, I'm always saying something. Or, or I might uh, be able to witness to someone, say something. Um, uh, one, of my, what, one of the things I'm doing on my last day, December the 24th, I took a whole bunch of tracks 
and uh, I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to take now, I was waiting for the cards, and then now to hand them out to all the customers at Tim Hortons, all the staff, and, and just give them a track, because there's a real good one for Christmas. But it is given that track, you, because laying down the, the uh, friendship of these people, they know who I am, so it's no problem for me to hand out the tracks there. But, but one thing I know with, notice in our society, you go to McDonald's, Burger King, Tim Hortons, everything is on time. And time, 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 time. And I'm, I'm getting tired of, you know, me, I'd like just to move along at a pace. But there, they have to get an order done within, within seconds. We, we had people who violently, I'm talking about over a cup of coffee. I mean, I feel sorry for the girls that work behind uh, the counter and wait on, on people generally. They are nasty, nasty over a cup of coffee. And some of the things that these girls go through, I, I literally pray for them because it's, it's, a, it's hard to deal with the public. And especially on time, if they don't get it in time, if you don't do it right. But you know something? That's because of hairiness. And they can't do the orders right. But then God says, wait, wait, wait. And most of us can relate to, to a comment made by a New England preacher, Philip Brooks. Normally, he was a calm man. But one day he was clearly agitated. He paced the floors like a caged lion. A friend, a friend asked him, what's the trouble, Brooks? He replied, the trouble is I'm in a hurry, but God isn't. God isn't in a hurry. We are. And so we have to learn to wait. Have you ever noticed the difference between God's timetables and ours? We think of terms like minutes, hours, days, but God works in terms of years. And uh, let me give you an example of, some of, our, uh, some of the men in the Bible that had to wait in years. We, there was a Joseph. Uh, you remember him. He, he, was the, he, he was the fellow that had the coats of many colors. God wanted him in a position of influence in Egypt. Did God put him there instantly? Nope. David had, or Joseph had to wait. We see that uh, when, uh, how did Joseph, uh, how did God get Joseph there? He was sold in slavery by his brother as a teenager, hauled off into a foreign land, falsely accused by uh, Potiphar's wife, thrown into prison, a long time went by, uh, and uh, don't you suppose that Joseph was praying fervently, saying, God, get me out of here? I've been wrongly uh, convicted. God didn't seem to hear. Finally, an opportunity came. Joseph had an, uh, had an interpreted uh, two dreams, two men, and one of the men was restored to position. The other one was hanged. Uh, and then he told the man, before you, uh, before you leave prison, can you just tell the, uh, tell the uh, king, uh, you know, uh, that I'm here. I want to get out of this prison. But guess what? He forgot. Another two years went by. And, uh, but, then, um, but then in Genesis 41.1, now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. Two years, think of two years ago in your own personal life. Can you remember what happened two years ago in your life? For two more years, Joseph languished in prison. That's a long time to wait on God because God had a plan. Yet Joseph had a relationship what? With God. Couldn't God have given Pharaoh his dream sooner? Why the long wait? Just like when I was thinking about our many times that we go by our church land. 
And many times I would say to the Lord, says, Lord, I, I know, Lord, I, I'd like to see a building there before I pass away or take me home to, the, you know, to heaven, but I would love to see a building there. You know what, the God, what God says? Wait. It's his timetable. It's his land. If he wants a church there, he's going to put it there. No matter what anybody says, what anybody do, it's his choice. Just that we're on a, t- <laughs> I'm on a timetable. We're, you know, each one of us is on a timetable. But yet, uh, why the long wait? Joseph spent the better part of his 20, either as a slave or in prison in Egypt. Eventually, Joseph became number two man next to Pharaoh, a long time to wait. Another example is, is the Apostle Paul. He was God's greatest apostle to the Gentiles. There was so much work to be done for the Lord and so little time, what, to do it. Paul wanted to go to Rome, then to Spain with the gospel. How did God get Paul to Rome? He had him in prison on false charges. In Acts 24, 5 and 6, if... Um, <clears throat> Acts chapter 24, 5, and 6. And it says here, For we have found this man a real pest and a fellow who stirred up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. And he's even tried to desecrate the temple. And then we arrest him. We want, wanted to judge him according to what? To our law. So he had false charges brought against him. And, and the governor in Caesarea heard his case, knew that he was innocent, but he kept him. We also see in, um, in Acts 24, uh, where it says that um, 25 and 26 And as Paul was discussing righteousness and self-control and judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. At the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Procurious fetus, which to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. And so, other words, if you would follow uh, Paul, he eventually get to Rome. But it took time to to get Paul there because God had a plan. Paul had it away. He knew God, so he didn't complain. He says, "God, why am I in this prison?" Uh, there's so much work to be done. We got to get the gospel message preached all over the world. Perhaps we can uh, relate when God seems distant. It always affects our emotions. We have emotions. God de- developed that in us as we wait on him. David himself was in turmoil, number B. David himself was in turmoil because in Psalm 13, 2, he says, How long shall I take counsel on my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the days? The idea of Hebrew, verse 2, is that there is a, there is a if you look at Psalms uh, 13, David starts out with, um, um, I used to be pretty fast at one time going, when we used to have Bible drills, we used to be really fast with their fingers going through the scriptures. But it says, it says, how long will thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? You could see that, that even having sorrow in my heart all the day, it's like there is a, uh, he goes from one thing to another. And, uh, and, and, and trying to get out of his, def- his difficulties. He's trying to get out of his difficulties. No matter how much planning you can do within your own heart, David made with with his men, they were all futile. All your planning folks 
that you're going to try to get out of your situation. You cry out to God. God is, doesn't seem to be, he's distant. He's not hearing you. He's on a vacation. But ah, I can maybe reason within my own heart that I can figure something out and maybe it, it, it will work. Maybe God will bless it. But guess what? It doesn't happen. David's enemy seems to be winning. We see this. Uh, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? We see Saul. Saul was going through the countryside and, and looking for David and his men. We see, uh, uh, we see uh, uh, Saul was still the king. Saul enjoyed the comfort of the palace while David was hiding, what? In a cave. Uh, what made it worse? Saul was the bad guy. But, uh, but it seems the Lord, uh, it's, and, and, but yet David was seeking the Lord. He was seeking the Lord. David uh, And Saul was the bad God. He wanted to kill David. And so, but yet many a times, David said in his heart, he is still the anointed king. Saul was still the anointed. God anointed him. And yet David saved Saul's life many times. He could have killed him, but he didn't because he wouldn't touch his hand on the anointed one. <clears throat> didn't God know what was happening? Couldn't God do something? Had God forgotten about David sooner or later? Maybe you'll be there. You're in an extended time of trial. You call out to God, but he doesn't answer. You try to figure out how to get out of your circumstances, but nothing works. You go from, from the heights of hope to the depths of despair so many times that your stomach can't take much more. And I'll tell you, that's when anxiety hits, when your muscles in your back starts to uh, get achy, your muscles in your, in your stomach and in the lower parts of your back, and you're trying to go to uh, massages and you're trying to work it out in your own. You, 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 you're going through so much and you don't think you're going you're gonna to you're gonna be able to endure it much more. Meanwhile, those who are following the Lord are living the, or meanwhile, those who aren't following the Lord, many, and I says, Lord, why aren't they? And sometimes we compare ourselves with the world. They don't seem like, they seem like they're prospering. Here I'm trying to make a living. They're, they're, they have big homes and maybe they, you know, and they're, they're using their money in a wise way. But Lord, I'm trying my best to supply for my family. It put food on the table. Seeking the Lord from the cave like David. Sometimes we are like that. We're in the cave. God is, dis God is so far away. There are two vital lessons to remember at such a time. Number one, God has not forgotten you. Isaiah 49, 14 and 15 says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. That's what kind of God we have. He's not going to forget us. He's not going to leave us. You may, suffer, uh, you may suffer for years, but God never forgets you if you are his child. And that you can take that to the bank and don't spend it. Is that how that saying goes? I, sometimes I don't get the, those sayings right. But in Hebrews 13, 5, it says, God himself has said, I will never forget you if you are his child. And I'll tell you, folks, I remember memorizing God's word. Because when you remember God's, remember God's word, guess what? You can come up with verses and say, yes, Lord, I know you will never forget me. I know you will never forsake me. I may have these emotions, but they're only emotions. But, what, but you have studied the scriptures. You see it. 
but somehow we, 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 we lose perspective. But God does seemingly forget some of his choicest servants, as we have seen. Joseph, Paul, David, all of them were shut up in unpleasant circumstances, what, for years, during which seems that God had forgotten. Do you know what was happening during that time? During those waiting times? I'll tell you. God was building maturity. See, God is, when you go through things like this, he's building you up to mature, spiritual, mature, individual. Into those men as they were learning to trust in him. That's why he does it. He wants us to, he's preparing us. He's maturing us. What happens? We, we hear it about all the situations of Christians being persecuted over there. It's slowly trickling over here, folks. It's slowly trickling. There's a lot of fear, fear. But, you know, through all those fears, we need to pray for those who persecute us, just like it says in the Word of God. Per, bless, you know, we need to pray for them because they need the Lord as well as you know, as anybody else. But fear is number one uh, culprit because when, we, when the enemy puts fear, we fall apart. We fall apart. But when we put our trust in God, that fear scatters. It dissipates. But God is with us. He would never forsake us. He would never, uh, he would never leave us. We, this, uh, so... But the second problem is there, uh, there is no such thing as instant godliness. We have individuals, sometimes teachers, that says, oh, you can get saved and, you're, and you'll, be, you'll have all the knowledge and got, you got the Holy Spirit and all these things and you'll walk with God. And, but guess what? Does it happen instantly? I know we have instant everything, but it takes years to develop spiritual maturity and trust in the Lord. This, all these things what the Lord uh, uh, says to us, it takes time. So in other words, when you, are, when you are grown in Christ, God is uniquely uh, developing your godly character with qualities uh, and, and to be an effective servant. You see, each one of you that's sitting here today, God is saying, you know, he, he has a plan for your life. He's, he's developing you in your unique character and, and giving you that spiritual maturity. And, and just when, when, when things get really out of hand, you can always know that God is there. And I thought in my head, I was thinking one day when I was around my house and I looked at the property and the home that the Lord give us and, and I said, what happens? What happens if the police comes? We just passed the law. We heard that you were a pastor. We're going to arrest you because you're causing disturbance in your, in your neighborhood. And immediately they can remove you out of your house as fast as a blink, put you in prison, bring all false charges. I think about things like this. You know, I, I think about things like that. I says, I could be in this house. Next minute, I could be in prison. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. The Lord says that we are going to have times of uh, uh, people hating us. I have people that have literally uh, said into my face that I hate your God. I don't believe there is a God. And, 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 and if they were that advent about it, they had no problem putting me in jail. Because to, to them, I'm a, uh, I'm a nuisance to them. And, and every, you know, so the Lord is building character in us. And so when, the, when these things do happen, we can know for sure God is, didn't forsake us. He's there with us. <clears throat> Number two, the petition, call to the Lord 
verse 13 and 34. It says, consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep, the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have overcome him. Lest my adversaries rejoice when I am shaken. Do you know why many Christians do not grow to make maturity and why they are not used by God in a mighty way? It's because when God seems distant to them, instead of calling out to him, they shrug their shoulders and say, oh well, and go back into the world. That is so sad when I see that. And they lived their lives like they used to. They didn't cry, they cried out and because of not being discipled or trained and someone takes them alongside and, and showing them about who God is, without that kind of help and support, you eventually will die and go back into the world. Or they go to these uh, bookstores and buy the latest self-help books. That is the growing market today is these self-help books. Since God can't help you, we have the latest technology. We have books here that can help you and, and develop your person, uh, you know, develop you. You can handle these situations on your own. I'll tell you, all the books in the world won't be able to do that. I praise God every morning I get out of bed. I praise God for giving me the strength for being with me in the morning time when I have my prayer, putting on the full armor of God, stepping out the door because I don't know what circ what's going to happen. There's things do happen because we have an enemy that will wants us gone, defeated, out of the way because we are a nuisance to him. And that's why these, uh, that's why we need to make sure when we leave that home that we keep the full armor of God on and that we need to trust God alone like he promises us in this scripture. David didn't do that. When God seemed distant, he called to him to answer him now, like it says, enlighten my eyes, lest I see death. Answer me, O Lord, my God, help me, help me in this circumstances. Where are you, God? Deliver me. David didn't, uh, we see here that he had this burden on his heart. Instead of turning from God, he turned to God. Instead of complaining to men, he talked to God about it. David, uh, David always went before the Lord. Do we complain to people about God? Or do we go to God and says, God, some of these people, that's what I do. I would go to God and says, this group here, it's bothering me. And yet, I don't ask the wrath of God to fall on them, but help me to be a testimony. What, what, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? Instead of leaning on my own heart. We see here there's four lessons from Psalm 13, 3 and 4. Our prayers should be concerned for God's glory. You see, the whole thing is God's glory, not just for our happiness. And David wasn't just praying for deliverance so that he could escape from his problems and be happy. His fear was that the enemy, he didn't, uh, he was more concerned about the enemy rejoicing uh, since David was uh, uh, anointed king. In other words, he was fear, uh, his fear was that the enemy would rejoice. He didn't want to see that. He says, Lord, what happens if, if I die? What happens if they kill me? But you know something? God's honor was tied up with David's deliverance because why David was anointed king nothing would ever happen to David because God put him there God will make sure that he was going uh, that he will come out of it 
If, if you profess, as David did, to trust in God alone, then your defeat becomes God's defeat. To defend his own honor, God will defend you as long as you are his child. So in times of crisis, you call out to God to rescue you, not just for your relief, but for God's glory. Everything that I, that I try to say, God, it's for your glory, not mine. I'm here on earth, but I, everything that I go through is for your glory. Whether at work or, or where I go at the bank or food shopping, whatever I'm doing, it's always for his glory. D, we must seek God, especially when he seems distant. We need to seek him. David was sensitive to the presence of God in his life. The test of your faith is not when God's presence is real. When you see God at work in your life, the real test of your faith is when God seems distant. Do you trust him? Do you trust him when he doesn't answer your prayers right away? Do you trust him? Do you wait on him? Or do you react quickly in your own life? Do you seek him then? Can we, uh, we must, number C, we must keep an awareness of, of God at the enemy before us at all times. We must keep an awareness of God and the enemy before us at all times. We need to keep both realities, God and Satan. They, uh, God, uh, we have God and we have Satan and there are, you know, there's a war going on. But we need to keep both of these realities before us as the factor which motivates us to holiness and put us on guard against sin. As Christians, the honor of God is at, at stake through us. If we fail him, the enemy will rejoice Satan is trying to drag the name of our Savior through the mud by getting us to forsake the Lord or fall uh, into sin. And we see this, how long will my enemy exalt over me? <clears throat> Number D, uh, God allows us to come to the end of ourselves so that we must rely on him. David was fearing for his life David was approaching, uh, uh, approaching, uh, death was approaching. David calls out to God to enlighten uh, his eyes, that is, to bring him from the brink of death back to life again. The Apostle Paul said that he and his cohorts in the gospel, despair even of life, um, had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. Sometimes God seems distant and allowed us to go right to the brink, to come to the end of ourselves so that we learn what? To trust him in these circumstances. By the time you get list, uh, finished with this, uh, with this speaking, you're going to say, ah, oh, my brain's, you know, how long, how long, you know? And um, number three, praise, trusting God's unfailing love. David has not yet been delivered, but he trusts in the loving kindness of what? The unfailing love of God. And a calm assurance comes over him. We see his heart is filled with joy as he thinks of the deliverance which God will bring bring about. By faith, David counts God's future deliverance, past and says in verse 6, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You see, uh, that David's circumstances had not changed. You see, David's circumstances had not changed one bit from the start of the psalm when he confessed Confessed, depressed, and forsaken by God, David was still hiding in caves. Saul was still on the throne trying to kill David. So what changed? David's focus changed. Your focus will change 
and as you shift from yourself to God. That shift in focus moved him from confession and depression to joy and praise. So God's love by his circumstances in trial, Satan tries to get us to doubt God's love, but we have to resist that temptation and affirm with God's word. In James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Also in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God calls all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. With Joseph, with Joseph we must affirm that even through these, uh, uh, those who wronged him meant it for evil, God meant it for good. In Genesis 5.20. So the main reason people do not trust God is that there's, they're too proud to remit their total need. Or uh, some people uh, would say, oh, you need God as your crutch. You're, but I would say to them, but yet I'm a cripple. I sure need God as my, he is my person that can, Help me through these difficult times. So in conclusion, the famous preacher, Charles Spurgeon, was walking through the English countryside with a friend. He noticed a barn with a weather vane. At the top of the vane were the words, God is love. Spurgeon remarked that this was inappropriate place for such a message because weather vanes are uh, changeable, but God's love is constant. But Spurgeon's friend uh, uh, said, I disagree. You misunderstood the meaning, he said. The weather vane is stating the truth that no matter which way the wind blows, God is love. When God seems distant, join David in trusting in God, on failing love. However, the wind of circumstances are blowing. As David wrote in Psalm 103:11, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great his love and kindness toward those who fear on him. I have this one, I was, I, I can't sing, but I want, before we, I close in prayer, his eye is on the sparrow, and I was listening to it, and I says, Lord, that is so true. And it says, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender word I hear. And resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when song gives place to sighing, when hope within, within me dies, I draw the closer to him, from care he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Isn't that true? He watches us. He, as long as you are his child, and if you're not his child, folks, I'll tell you, come to him. If you're depressed, if you feel distance, if you're going through some trials, call upon him. Don't forsake him. He's there. He's watching over you. He's not going to let you fall. You know, he knows every hair on your head. He, he knows them all by number. He even knows the names of all the stars in heaven. God is, but yet God loves us so much. But uh, trust him as we leave here today. Let's pray. Father God, I, it's so wonderful and to talk and, and to see how good you are. 
and, 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 and using your servant David as what we have learned so much, that I have learned so much from him and his life. And, and Lord, one of the people in heaven I'd like to see is David. And, and just to uh, be able to uh, appreciate uh, uh, telling us something about him, even though, oh Lord, you, you have these men in the Bible to teach us things and, and to learn from them and, 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 uh, and, and how you use their lives, Father. But I just pray, Father, as each of us leave here today, that we may go over Psalm 13 and in other parts of the scriptures, Lord, and, and to see, Lord, that uh, when we do fall into some kind of circumstances, that you'll lift us up, put us on solid ground. And Lord, I, I, I just thank you over and over again. And there's words in my heart that I can't even express, but Lord, the gratitude of our salvation and how you have chosen us. Oh, Lord, thank you again for this time. And I praise your name and glorify your name. And, and, and I bring all these things to bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully this teaching has blessed you today. Trust you will join us weekly in pursuing God through his word. You can join us at seasidecommunity.org, Facebook, or via YouTube. We always enjoy our listeners' feedback, so send your comments and prayer requests to info at seasidecommunity.org, for we would love to hear from you. And now, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit.